Hi everyone, a warm welcome to you all to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Martin and I'm the Manager of Programming and External Relations at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. The theme for today's discussion is Giving Big, the impact of large unrestricted gifts on nonprofits. We're so glad you've joined us. First, for those of you tuning in who are new to CEP, I'd love to share a bit about us. Our work is focused on philanthropic effectiveness. For over two decades, we have sought to help foundations and increasingly individual donors to improve their effectiveness and increase their impact. We do this through assessments and research reports that often lift up the perspectives of those who wouldn't otherwise be heard, as well as programs like this one. We're a nonprofit and rely on grants and contributions to support our research and programs. So please reach out if you're interested in supporting us. Our calendar for opting into a round of grantee, donor, or staff surveys in 2023 is filling out fast, so please also reach out if you work at a grant maker and would like to learn more about our assessments, especially as you plan for the next year. Today's webinar is the final in a series of virtual gatherings this year on topics related to philanthropic effectiveness. Please be sure to join our mailing list so you can be notified of our future events and resources. I also want to say a special thank you to our event sponsors. Our premier sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, and our sponsors, Archstone Foundation, Jacob and Valeria Langloff Foundation, and New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. Next, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, we are in a webinar format, which means all of you are muted and have your videos off upon entering the session. If you have questions for our panelists today during the presentation, and we surely hope you do, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We will try to be responsive to as many questions as possible during our Q&A time at the end of the webinar. We will not be using the hand raising function as we are not asking attendees to speak their questions. And if you require technical assistance at any time, please reach out to my colleague, Say Darling at saed at cep.org and he can assist you. We'll also be sharing some resources with you via the chat box. So please feel free to check there for helpful links. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and we will send a link to all registrants in a follow-up email. We will also send a follow-up email with links to the resources you will hear about in today's discussion. Now that housekeeping is out of the way, I have the privilege of introducing our speakers and panelists. So our panels today include Ellie Buteau, the Director of Research Projects and Special Advisor on Research Methodology and Analysis at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Uh, Stephanie Gillis, Director of Impact Driven Philanthropy Initiative at the Rakes Foundation. Kyra Kyles, the Chief Executive Officer at YR Media. And Lisa Ratliff, Chief Executive Officer at Kaboom. Today's moderator is my colleague, Phil Buchanan, the President of Center for Effective Philanthropy. Phil and my colleague, Grace Nicolette, co host a podcast together called Giving Done Right that I encourage you to check out because this week's episode, out on Thursday, is focused on the research we will be discussing today and on the implications of Mackenzie Scott's approach for other donors, big and small. We're so grateful for all of you uh, for joining us today. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Phil. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, really appreciate it. It is great to have so many folks on this webinar, uh, 1500 registrants. Uh, and before we get into the substance of our conversation today. I want to acknowledge uh, that many, many people contributed to making this webinar possible and also to the execution of the research that we're going to be discussing today. So the authors of the report that we released today are Ellie Buteau, who you'll be hearing from in a moment, uh, Maria Lopez, Katerina Malmgren, and Christina M., uh, all staff of the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Uh, we also received uh, funding from a number of foundations to undertake this research. This is the first of a three-year uh, study, first year that we'll be talking about today. And the Hilton Foundation uh, was the lead funder, and we also received support from the Barr, Ford, Rakes, Rita Allen, and School Foundations, as well as the Houston Endowment. Uh, so we're really grateful for that. We have had the benefit of an amazing study advisory group uh, that's listed on our website that includes many leaders of nonprofits that received support from Mackenzie Scott, as well as the funders of the project and a couple of others. 
Um, there's a whole bunch of other people at CEP who have worked on this project in one way or another, too numerous uh, to name. A uh, little bit of background and disclosure disclaimer. We ourselves at CEP received $10 million in May of uh, 2021 from uh, Mackenzie Scott. And I think at the board meeting where we were telling our board uh, that this had happened, a couple of our uh, board colleagues said, you know, we should study this. This is a really interesting um, effort and we should seek to understand it uh, better. Um, there was a question of, are we conflicted here? Uh, we obviously didn't answer our own survey uh, and we separately funded this. And we realized that, you know, folks either have a gift from Mackenzie Scott or they're seeking one. And so everybody um, in one way or another is, isn't exactly um, uh, you know, is is in a is is in a sort of a funny position given the level of funding, but that we would just be true to the data and open about uh, our our own experience. So, why even do this? Why study this? Is it to suggest that everyone can or should approach uh, giving like Mackenzie Scott? Um, you know, of course not. And as uh, Ruth Levine, the uh, very wise CEO of ID Insight, who's on our study advisor group, pointed out in a great blog post on our blog, you know, to a certain extent, uh, Mackenzie Scott's approach builds on the approach of others and, and the vetting that other funders have done of, of various nonprofits. That said, we do think that there's a huge opportunity here to learn um, and that there are lessons that are useful for donors broadly. What can we understand about the experience of nonprofits receiving large unrestricted gifts with minimal reporting requirements? Um, what can we learn from Mackenzie Scott's focus on uh, equity about her funding of a group of organizations that, judging by the data we've collected, has a leadership that is much more racially diverse than the leaders of, say, grantees of foundations broadly? So there's a lot of discussion, of course, about Mackenzie Scott's approach, much celebration of it, uh, folks who sort of see it as a almost like a repudiation of a top-down donor-driven approach. Uh, but also, you know, we've heard a fair amount of often quieter sort of critique and worry. Would organizations have the, to use a term that others use, absorptive capacity to handle uh, gifts uh, of this size? Um, would they know how to allocate them? Would they experience other funders pulling back, perhaps, uh, saying, you know, you don't really need our support anymore. So that was our feeling about why we need data and, and research is to actually understand this more broadly. And we are by no means the only ones interested in this and looking at this. Uh, Panorama Global is doing important work, I think, to bring together uh, recipients of McKinsey Scott's giving and learn from that experience. Um, obviously, Bridgeband, which has done the uh, vetting, much of the vetting for Mackenzie Scott also has um, research on the approach of other donors that have operated in a similar manner that I think um, they will be publicizing in the in the weeks to come. Uh, but we offer up what we've learned so far, you know, to generate discussion and hopefully some insight. And with that, I would love to ask uh, Ellie, Kyra, Lisa, and Stephanie to join, and we'll start to get into it. Um, they were all introduced by Sarah before. Great to see you all. Um, just a little bit more context. Kyra leads uh, YR Media, which is a national network of young journalists and artists, and they collaborate with peers around the country to create content that matters. And I'm sure as she uh, discusses her experience, you'll hear more about their important work. Uh, Lisa Ratliff runs uh, Kaboom, which unites with communities to build kid-designed play spaces. And they um, have been doing this, you've likely heard of them, for uh, decades, and they are focused on um, creating a sense of belonging and sparking joy for kids and communities of color, which have disproportionately had less access uh, to play where they learn and live. Um, finally, Stephanie Gillis is a director at the Rakes Foundation, which invests in youth serving institutions and systems to make them more effective in supporting and empowering all young people, especially those who have been marginalized. Uh, these are just the best possible people to talk about this research. I can't wait uh, to get into it. Um, 
But before I bring you into the conversation, I want to welcome uh, Ellie Buteau, who has led this research effort, which has been a lot of work. Um, so Ellie, thank you for all that you've done uh, to gather all of this data with the team. Um, and I would love to just have you start by explaining to folks like what we did um, and um, you know what we sort of hope to learn in, in this effort. Sure. Um, so the research was designed to answer three main questions. Uh, whether nonprofits believe the gift has increased their organization's impact and how, um, how they're using the grant money and the reasons that they made those choices. And then finally, um, whether or not they've experienced any unintended negative consequences as a result of being a recipient uh, of these gifts. We sent surveys to all of the organizations that received a gift from Scott between the summer of 2020 and the summer of 2021. 277 of those organizations responded to the survey for a response rate of 36%. And then we also interviewed 40 of the survey uh, respondents in depth interviews. That's great. And so what I think we're gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to share a little bit about our first finding and then we're gonna stop and discuss and then, and then we'll get to some of our other findings. Um, so can you describe that finding? Like what, what, what was the first thing we learned when we looked at all this uh, data? Yes. Um, so our first finding was that nonprofit leaders described these large unrestricted grants as transformational for their organizations and for their leadership. Um, they believe the funding is significantly strengthening their organization's ability to achieve its mission, which for many is connected to advancing equity. And leaders expressed strong emotional reactions upon learning that they were a recipient of such a large unrestricted gift um, from joy to shock uh, to excitement. Um, one leader said that the amount of money didn't even feel real, that what felt more real was the pride and validation that the work they were doing mattered and that somebody had noticed. Um, another leader said, quote, I was left in awe. I didn't know what to say except thank you. Our core values were repeated back to us as we were given this gift and investment. I thought, wow, we can now support the growth of our organization and concentrate on our work, not the fundraising needed. And this was the largest unrestricted grant ever received for 88% of responding organizations. Uh, the median grant amount was $8 million and made up 69% of the organ organization's budget for the year prior um, to receiving the grant. And just as larger context, um, the typical foundation grant that nonprofits receive from a large foundation is about $100,000 at the median. So these grants from Scott were at the median. 80 times the size of a typical grant from a large foundation. Uh, over 80% of responding organizations said that this grant will significantly strengthen their organization's ability to achieve its mission. Uh, close to two thirds believe it will significantly strengthen their long-term financial stability and close to two thirds believe it will significantly strengthen their long-term organizational capacity. These grants have enabled many organizations to pursue opportunities that historically have been difficult to fundraise for, uh, including work on equity uh, and work on justice. And equity is a core part of the mission of many of these recipient organizations. Leaders say that these gifts allow their organizations to contribute to advancing uh, equity more effectively than they could have otherwise, particularly when it comes to racial equity uh, and economic mobility. And the final thing I'll share from, from this first finding is that many nonprofit leaders say the gift enabled them to change their approach to leading. So from a shift from a scarcity mindset to one of transformational opportunities, to a sense of relief and finally some breathing room, uh, the opportunity to be more innovative and take more risks. Uh, and along with these positive effects on their approach to leadership, one quarter of those we interviewed did describe feelings of kind of a self-imposed pressure to spend these gifts well. It's so interesting. And I know we were very focused on sort of the organizational impact. And then we saw what this meant personally for people as leaders and how they described it, changing their approach to leadership. And obviously the two things are connected, 
But um, I, for one, did not. I think I underestimated just sort of the emotional power uh, in the receipt of these gifts. And I'd love to bring um, uh, Kyra and Lisa in first. Um, Lisa, does this resonate for you with your, your own experience uh, at Kaboom? Yeah, I just was thinking as you were saying that, um, I burst into tears and I'm unashamed at saying that. I'm not a big crier. No but- shame. I, um, when I was informed, I, um, I literally burst into tears. I had, it was such a sense of release, relief, it, you know, think about it. We were still in the pandemic. Um, the future of the organization was heavy on a lot of our shoulders. And it was a time where we were trying to adapt and do relevant work. And then, so to get a call like that and to say, literally have someone say, I believe in the work that you're doing and I'm going to give you a big gift, it was overwhelming. Um, so yeah, I was just thinking, I, I burst into tears. <laughs> and uh, Kyra, how about you? Did you cry? I cried, I'll just say, <laughs> but did you cry? I just, if we're all disclosing here. Yeah, I was really deeply moved. I will admit the first time I saw the email, I said, is this a phishing attempt? What yeah, is this? You know, yeah. I was I was kind of uh, skeptical a little bit. But it it really meant so much to me. You know, I was coming into the organization, taking over from a founder, moving from Chicago to Oakland to be in our headquarters. And during this pivotal time of the pandemic and just wanting to get that space to really strategize and plan for the future and also trying to figure out ways to really reward and incentivize our staff, you know, during a, a particularly tumultuous time. And so to receive this sort of gift with no real strings attached and Hey, you, all we ask is that you, you know, keep it quiet until we say that it's okay, and then they allowed us to to share that. And I think sharing that was huge. It was it was such a, a great benefit to be able to talk about it publicly. And really, the focus on women leaders of color was really powerful for me because I will admit that one of the things that concerned me in taking over at Wire Media was. I am a black woman and I'm reading all these studies and surveys that say black women led organizations are at the very bottom of of kind of this foundational or funder priority. And so I'm already concerned about that to see this gift and someone to call you and contact you and say, pretty much because of who you are, you are going to get something like this of this magnitude. It was extremely moving. Yes. It's interesting. And um, Ellie, I don't know if you want to say anything about about what we noticed in the interviews with leaders of color, I mean, very much uh, consistent with what Kyra just described, but I mean, it was so um, significant, profound, that we created a whole sidebar of just the way leaders of color talked about the experience. You want to add anything from the research? Sure. I mean, directly related to to what Kyra just said, right? In, in our research, a number of leaders of color felt that the experience of receiving this grant from Mackenzie Scott positioned them as a an asset to their organization rather than as a liability, which many previous funding experiences had you know, made them feel. Um, and in addition, Scott's trust in these organizations to use the money as they saw fit for their constituents in their communities um, was you know, a very different experience that she wasn't telling leaders what to do or how to do it. And many leaders of color shared with us examples of how this increased the impact of her gift on equity tenfold. Yeah, this sort of mindset of, you know, here's this grant, but don't use it on this or don't use it on that. And, you know, definitely not so much on salaries, right, as if somehow some things are about mission and some things aren't. I mean, that actually relates to, as as we're hearing, uh, the ability to focus on equity, because um, one of the things that came through from some of the folks we interviewed is people don't always find it easy to fundraise uh, for, and Ellie referred to that already, that work. Um, before we bring Stephanie into the conversation, um, Lisa or Kyra, do you want to talk about that element of, of this gift, like how it related to your organization's work with respect to racial equity or other forms of equity? Kyra and I are being polite to each other. <laughs> yeah, no, none of that. No yeah, politeness. no. Um, I, I'll start. I, I, you know, so we had been on a journey where you know, the backdrop of this is all of us exist because there are some inequities and biases in our system. So I think that's a little bit ironic to begin with. You know, there's a systems failure within our country that is decades and hundreds of years in the making. And so we exist to address the inequities. 
um, we had been on a journey that was about getting really comfortable with explicit, explicitly naming the inequities that we are addressing. And so, uh, geez, eight months before we had named place-based inequity as the issue that we are addressing as an organization. And I think that it was um, really important to lift up this narrative and to normalize a conversation around equity and that, you know, there are systems failures, there are biases that nonprofits and many others exist to address. Um, and I also think that um, we are in a, transform a transformational moment where the more that we talk about this, the more that we name those systems failures, the more that we come together in collaboration to address them, the better equipped we are to actually fix them and have the work of our collective us be transformational. Beautifully said, Lisa. So I'll add, I'll build on to that. I, one of the, the cornerstones of Wire Media is that we pay our, our young emerging content creators for everything that they do. We give them learning stipends, we pay them for their employment. When they speak for us on behalf of the organization, we provide them with stipends. We want them to understand that their work has value. And so we definitely want to have that go up to our staff. You know, here's a team of people that are working with these young people, mentoring them. And in fact, about 25% of the young people that come through our programming are part of our staff. So what do we look like all of a sudden now that it comes to your being a, a full adult employee and then all of a sudden that wage equity goes by the wayside. So one of the things we did invest in is a wage equity increase so that those who were at the lower end of our scale were increased in salary by 26%. Um, so that was really important to us because a lot of times we do hear, we don't want to spend the money on overhead. That's not what we do, but we could not do this work without the people that make it possible. And so that was really the biggest priority in addition to creating reserves so that we have the space to strategize and the space to plan for the future, but really reinvesting in our team and in professional development resources that they need so that they can then pour that back into the young people that we serve. Thanks, Kyra. So Stephanie, I want to I want to bring you in. I mean, I've heard some people say, look, nothing Mackenzie Scott is doing, you know, is in and of itself new. There have been other big gifts before. There have been other uh, unrestricted gifts, other streamlined reporting processes, other donors focused on equity. But nobody's put this, those elements together in the way or at the scale that she has clearly. It is as Ellie pointed out, just comparing, you know, the typical grant size, it's just, it's just a massive uh, difference from sort of the conventional foundation approach. So as a, as a funder at a relatively young uh, foundation with living donors, what did you, what are you taking away from um, sort of the, what we're discussing, the way this gift has impacted organizations and leaders and helped them to advance equity? Yeah, well, I mean, like Lisa and Kyra, when we were starting this call today, we're like, we're doing happy dances. It's really um, just amazing and awesome to see the stewardship and commitment and, and um, you know, leadership that these investees showed um, in what they're doing with the resources and affirmation that, you know, it's such... Um, this is trust-based philanthropy as everyone speaks about, but it's at a different level. Um, and, you know, I think one thing I do want to say, I don't, it doesn't necessarily take more resources to address equity in organizations, right? Like there, there are structural barriers that have been referenced already facing leaders of color in our sector that can be addressed without a windfall um, and should be. And at the same time, the examples in, in the research of you know, the down payment assistance fund for BIPOC first time home buyers or the organization that closed the voter registration gap between the white electorate and people of color, like real change. And, um, you know, leaders of color investing in staff and benefits like Kyra reference, like so important. Those are all like um, incredible contributions and seeing how that is um, really addressing um, equity in our sector and in the world is so exciting. And I think, you know, you don't want to lose sight of just how transformational all the stories and anecdotes and quotes that Ellie shared at the outset. Um, you know, you just, I dare anybody to read this report and not see the humility and accountability and tremendous commitment of these leaders to doing what's best for the communities they strive to serve. And, you know, it's just really 
lovely to have an example of philanthropy playing the role of risk capital. These, these are dream funds. Um, these are dream funds for leaders who deserve to be resourced to dream. And um, it's really awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's really quite infuriating how much negative stereotyping there is of nonprofit leaders, right? And and this, and 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 so, I hope that um, the thoughtfulness that is apparent in the data that you're referencing, Stephanie, helps people confront some of that. And and I guess I'm curious before we get to our second finding, Stephanie. Another question for you was just in terms of the Rakes Foundation and your approach. Are you finding yourself feeling like? what we are doing is sort of been affirmed here like this just gives us more um more evidence behind our approach or did you question anything as you saw Mackenzie Scott and say hmm maybe we'll do something different because we've been inspired by her approach hmm um, well, goodness knows we have plenty of room to get better always and are always going to be working harder on that. And there's certainly things, I mean, the $100,000 median gift, I, I found myself wondering, are we a large foundation or not? I don't think we are, but um, that, you know, I, it, fewer larger gifts is really um, so valuable in the field. And we always challenge ourselves to try to do that. Um, we are you know trying to do more and more of all the best practices that we know have to happen the multi-year the long-term relationship all those things um, and who right and who we're supporting I think I'm um, holding ourselves accountable all of we have to do all the same things that the leaders are doing um, and so I I do think that there are plenty of spaces where we um, see things that we can learn and take um, and there are things that are affirming um, that we've known and we've been trying to share with the world and, and push for in other donors. Great, thank you. So one of the things that we have all heard is this notion that, um, and I've talked you know, with the three of you about this, that um, Donors will say uh, organizations don't have the quote unquote absorptive capacity to handle uh, gifts like this. And so one of the things we wanted to do is 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 look at, well, what do leaders specifically do uh, with these funds? And so, um, Ellie, can you walk us through this second finding uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about about that data? Sure. Um, the second finding is that nonprofits are using the grant money to help those they seek to serve, right, by improving or expanding existing work and engaging in new work, which often means bringing on new staff to take on that, that work. Most organizations are also using the money to improve their financial stability and to fairly compensate and support staff. The organizations that, that responded to the survey generally had decided how to use nearly all of the grant money. Um, they're typically spreading the grant money across a range of programmatic, financial, and operational efforts. And while the typical respondent to the survey had spent less than 30% of the funds at the time of the survey, most had already determined uses uh, for the rest of the grant. Organizations prioritize putting money toward their programmatic work, believing that that would lead to the greatest impact. Um, almost every nonprofit that we surveyed is using grant money uh, for some element of programmatic work. Most frequently, those uses include supporting new or existing programmatic work, uh, activities to better align the organization with achieving its mission, uh, and providing money or needed supplies to constituents and other nonprofits, um, such as through regranting. Uh, in addition, almost all of the nonprofits surveyed um, are using the money to improve their organization's financial stability, uh, most frequently for financial reserves or an endowment to create a special opportunities fund uh, or for fundraising. And finally, most of the organizations are using the grant money for staff and operational needs. They're most frequently using the funds for hiring staff or consultants increasing salaries or improving benefits, upgrading their technological infrastructure, 
um, and providing professional development. What is the expression like, don't spend it all in one place? That's what people will say, right? Like, and they didn't, right? They, they, their folks are spreading it across um, different aspects of their work. They're, they're both expanding programmatic work and shoring up financial sustainability and dealing with operational issues. Um, and as to absorptive capacity, doesn't seem to be a problem, right? And, and so I, I'm curious, um, reactions, uh, Lisa, Kyra, Stephanie, and, and, and anything you want to share about what you were able to do with these resources, uh, you know, what, what, how you allocated those funds in the cases of uh, Kyra and Lisa. Kyra? Sure, I can jump in. So we, of course, reserves, very important to have reserves building, because as I mentioned, that gives us the space to really strategize, to really think, to not allow mission creep because we're trying to pursue certain funding. So that, that was really great and really rewarding to be able to build a financial cushion and also inspiration to continue to build upon that. The second item I mentioned was the wage equity increase. That was something that was extremely important, you know, not just for our staff, but for the young people that we serve. And also, and to the point of some of the others, uh, expansion, really increasing our impact. So we're already building out physical headquarters in Chicago. And so to create our Midwest hub that we've been building out virtually for the past two years. And so it was really important to be able to not only be able to, to get that space, but also to have all the supports that YR Media includes, which is like mental health counseling, healthy food, all the things that the young content creators have told us that they want and that they need academic advising and even financial coaching. So it allows us to do that. And then also look into the future at other places that we can go where we would be helpful and impactful, not coming and taking away from some of the organizations that are there, but complementing the landscape. And I think without having that cushion, it's very hard to, to argue for why you should be doing that. I think there's a nonprofit misnomer, and I'm familiar with this from coming from a media background of, you should really be trying to do more with less. And I'm like, why? You know, why should we be doing that? Why don't you test us? You know, as you mentioned, they were worried that some people will get this and, and not be able to handle it. But I think we're seeing proof that you definitely can handle it. And in fact, it just goes to increase that impact. But we'll never know unless you entrust the organizations to spend the money the way that they see fit. And I, I think we're looking at these survey findings and we're hearing, you know, in the media that this money is going exactly where it needs to go. It's it's so um, important, I think, to emphasize how common it is, and it really is so common for funders, major foundations. You know, I with I have friends who work at some of these places. Uh, for the mindset to be, well, we don't really care about the organizations; we just care about you know the programs or the, the goals that they're pursuing as if those two could somehow be separated, right? Um, and even sometimes, you know, we at CEP, when we're working to provide grantee feedback to uh, foundations through our grantee perception report, we'll hear, well, you know, if the nonprofits, you know, don't feel great about us, that just shows that we're really holding their feet to the fire, you know, because that's just the inevitable, like collateral damage of our focus on impact. Like people say that, right? And um, and you hear that in you hear that in boardrooms. And um, I, so I think Mackenzie Scott's approach is 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 really upending that and challenging that and saying no, actually these institutions matter, and I trust them, you know, to figure out what needs to be done for the long haul. Um, Lisa, did you have any challenges absorbing this gift? <laughs> I am. I, I'm thankful for the mute button because as you were talking, I was over here like, mm, and yeah. <laughs> I um, saw it too. She was struggling <laughs> to keep it together. Yes. Um, and, you know, let, let me say this. I am so grateful that this space is being created for us to have these kinds of honest conversations and that you're having like record number of registrants who kind of want to come together and learn from each other because I think this is the work that is necessary to change. You used the word infuriating. And I actually wrote down a piece of the report and I don't know if he did this intentionally, but I thought this was so beautifully done that you said, um, women-led, black-led organizations tend to be at the very bottom of the pile for philanthropists. And then the very next sentence is some, 
have often quietly expressed concerns that recipient organizations might be overwhelmed by the gifts or that they would lead to unintended negative consequences or there might be a misuse of funds. And then later in the report, you talked about, you know, uh, restricted giving as the prevailing approach, implying that nonprofits can't be trusted. And I tell you what, like my blood was boiling reading that. And even just thinking about what Kyra was saying around, you know, she walked into a role knowing as a woman, as a Black woman, that um, she's not typically getting the kinds of gifts that are necessary to run a healthy organization. And yet so many of us, are so close to the problem. We, our lived experiences give us a shortcut to solving the problem. And the thing that is named is we might be irresponsible or not be able to use the resources wisely. That's and insulting. It, it, it is, it's, and, and we have to change that. Like we need to talk about that and change the narrative and really lift up the asset in having somebody that has been part of, uh, I'm putting this in quote, a minority population, because we can innovate, we can solve problems in a different way, we can build trust among the people that we exist to serve. And let's talk about that. You know, if we are existing to solve the problems because of the system's breakdown, let's solve the problems. Let's stop, you know, restricting the solutions because that perpetuates the issue. And we then become part of the problem. So I, um, I'm, I'm over here like on my rant. I know that, but I think that's the conversation that we need to lift up because that's the work of our time. You know, we're multi generations who are dealing with this stuff, and if we can start to think about how we utilize the assets that we have and allow people to innovate and solve problems the way that they know that they can get done, we could we could address the gaps. Um, I'll quickly say, but if, you know, for Kaboom, we um, we were ready. We were ready for a gift like this. The um, and it came from a board member years ago asking us. We were talking about the big bets, you know, all the conversations around big bets. A uh, board member saying, "What if I gave you a billion dollars?" He didn't have a billion dollars to give us, but what if I gave you a billion dollars? How would you solve your problem? And um, I'm sure a CEO at the time could have answered it beautifully, but I was heading up development and I kind of oohed and awed through the answer. Like we do this and we do that, and we do this. And after that, um, we had been doing some learning and experimentation on how we go from one project to um, one system and really making deep impact. We looked at, okay, let's work backwards. If we're gonna solve our um, mission, if we're gonna achieve our mission, what's it gonna take? How are we gonna work differently? What are we gonna build? What kind of resources do we need to put in place? What kind of skills don't we have? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about that. And I encourage us all to think about that. Like, let's look at what are the results we wanna see? Let's work backwards and let's be ready to think about what is the pathway to achievement? If money were not a, an issue, what is it gonna take so that we are ready? And for us, um, getting that gift it absolutely was transformational because though we were ready and we had the answers in place, um, we didn't have the resources to jump. We still had to be very conservative in our approach because of the restricted gifts. Uh, but having this on the table, it allowed us to say, okay, we know exactly what we need to do. Let's jump and do it. And let's challenge ourselves and let's challenge others to come to the table to problem solve. So long answer, forgive me for my rant, but I think it's something we got to talk about. No, I, this is great. And and I think your example is, is so important because you had a strategy to achieve something and what you needed was funding from a supportive donor who was willing to get behind your strategy. But sometimes the way topics are discussed in our field, things get sort of dumbed down and we get these binaries. And so I want to ask Stephanie about this because I was in a, I was a guest speaker at a business school class recently at a, you know, it's, this is like a good business school. And the professor uh, is of course on philanthropy and the professor put up a slide and basically said, there's, there's, there's two approaches that are, you know, generating a lot of attention, strategy and trust-based as if they were, it was like a binary, um, you know, they're, they're sort of like the it, it, people who care about results and people who just want a hug or something, you know, when in fact, like, I think what we're seeing, right, is that a trusting approach to 
the, and so trust has to be earned, obviously, right? It's not, it's not um, just given, but a trusting approach, a, a, an approach that allows the leader to make the decisions with their staff, with their board about how to allocate funds to pursue shared goals is more effective, right? It's not like, it's not like just a nice thing. It's, it's actually going to generate more impact, right? So I, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on this, Stephanie, because you're, you're, donors uh, behind the Rakes Foundation, Jeff and Trisha Rakes. I mean, they're, you know, Jeff was the CEO of the Gates Foundation and they were pretty focused on, um, you know, results. And then you're also a practitioner of a sort of trust-based approach. Do you see those things as intention as that business school professor I described does, or do you see them as actually, as that, that's a false binary and they, and they go together? Yeah. I mean, I think one of it's getting more um, coverage now, but when these gifts first started, um, the Scott giving, there was a lot of like, oh, um, you know, she's just throwing it out there, like as though no one had done any research or or um, had connected with anyone in the field, or you know, and then kind of more became clear around the the um, role that Bridgespan was playing and others. And um, I think it's really important to know that there's a lot of I'm of two minds, Phil. So I'll say, yes, we think that you can't get to impact if you're not thinking about equity. You do think about effectiveness, of course, but there's a lot of things wrapped up in that term of effectiveness that we know. We were talking earlier about how there are just structural barriers and biases that leave certain re organizations under-resourced and they can't invest in the same way in the evidence space, for example, and that, you know, money begets money <laughs> in our field in some ways, and we'll talk about that later. So um, I think it, it is um, important to acknowledge that it's a fraught term, but nonetheless, the most effective leaders we find are people who are um, following best practices, leaning in these women on our call today are, are just amazing. And there's so many, and the, so many have been under-resourced for so long. Um, and so we just need to kind of set that aside. You need, yes, you everyone um, can uh, really benefit when they're trusted with the resources to do the work that needs to get done and they know best what needs to get done. Yeah, thank you. Um... Lisa or Kyra, anything you want to add on this? And 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 maybe I'm maybe I'm setting it up um, as as more of a dynamic than it really is. But I really do hear this a lot, like this notion that, well, you know, we're not about trust because we're about you know metrics and impact. And I, it's like, huh? You know, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I'm waiting for you, Kyra. <laughs> um, you go first. Yeah. I'll jump in. We, we do a good job building off of each other. I, I'm for with sure. you, Phil. I think that they work alongside each other. One of the things I'll be really interested in is, uh, as you know, kind of the study unfolds over the years, is to look at the innovation. So a lot of the leaders are looking at um, now I have the freedom to do things the way I know they need to get done and look at what is the impact of those innovations on the work and the progress that's being made. Because that's, you know, that kind of trust-based giving has informed real strategic thinking, not donor-directed strategic thinking, real strategic thinking and innovation on here's how I solve this problem. Here's how I start to foster and form the partnerships that I need to be able to problem solve without anybody telling me what to do. So that trust works directly with strategy because it is allowing us to innovate and really think about problem solving versus trying to create this win-win where, okay, I fall into your bucket and this is kind of how I'm gonna do my work in a way that aligns with what you need us to do. Um, that's, you know, there's not real trust there and there's not real strategy that can be developed in solving the problem. So I think it'll be interesting to kind of watch how do, I, it was such a high percentage of nonprofits that were focused on program and innovation. How does that innovation um, correlate to impact and change in their um, organization? Thanks, and Lisa. I'll, I'll add, you know, I'm a journalist by trade, so I believe in facts over feelings. So I love anecdotal evidence and I think it's super important, but I also believe it's fair for the public and the people that we're working with, quite frankly, to want to know what is our impact and how do we measure it? And I think it's important to create the impact metrics 
with your the people that you're you're serving or that you're collaborating with in mind and then to hold yourself to that standard so i don't see them as being two things that are separate but two things that can work together but what i do feel is that the trust piece can sometimes be impacted by other factors and lisa pointed it out earlier when you're dealing with organizations that are led by people of color or specifically women of color or even more specific black women the trust levels are not just based on the organization's reputation. It's based on who the person is sitting at the helm or who it is in the management position. And I think that's the piece that we really need to kind of take apart, deconstruct, and look at. Is your trust in the person or the individual, or is it in the organization and its goals? Like we put out impact reports. It's fairly easy to measure. It's not like most nonprofits are just working in the shadows and expecting people to fund that because that's not even a fair assessment. But I would even compare it to like the analogy of a restaurant. Do you go behind the, the, the wall and follow the chef around in a restaurant to see exactly what the chef is doing and what the team is doing? No. Now, you may look at the rating that they have from public safety, depending on where you are. You may look at reviews on Google, but you have to have a certain amount of trust or else you, the experience is going to be broken. And so what I think it is, is that it should be equitable and that it shouldn't be about your identity or your gender for that trust to be coming full circle. Of course, you should measure impact because how else would we know if we're making any sorts of enhancements or improvements? But at the same time, if, if everything is based on identity, then that's also giving us, we're not getting a fair shake. Thank you, Kyra. And 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 Lisa and Stephanie, I feel like uh, so much under underneath a lot of this is like who's best positioned to actually figure out what strategies are going to work to achieve goals, you know, and okay. and the notion that like donors in conference rooms with consultants are going to figure it out, and then the nonprofits are going to be like, oh yeah, brilliant, you know that that tracks exactly what we were thinking, uh, is is bananas. Uh, Stephanie, before we turn to our third finding, yeah, I was going to say one little story from, and I'll tell you how old I am. I mean, a long, long, long time ago when I was working in a youth leadership organization. Uh, you know, it's all about who gets to define what is effective too, who defines those metrics and those outcomes. And um, this was a job right out of graduate school where I was in this organization. And up until that point, the only thing our funders had ever asked us to tell them was how many unduplicated views came through our doors. Like the most um, meaningless and um, harmful metric actually actually, because you want young people to be touched by as many organizations as possible. Like not, that is like just absolutely so wrongheaded. And I know this was a long time ago and many of those practices have changed, but it was so striking even then. And we spent, I don't know, 18 months defining what we wanted the outcomes to be across all of our programs. What is it that we're hoping young people coming through our doors are getting with us and from us? And how might we measure that? And how are we, and that's where the power comes because it's what the organizations need and want. It's what the organizations can use to learn, get better. It's what um, then can be shared. Um, so it's all about who gets to define what it, what is effective, right? Yeah, exactly. I feel like I could, I could, you know, maybe with the help of you all, we could do a a, a show like a comedy show on on dumb metrics, you know, that don't that don't actually tell you anything. Um, but rather than doing that, let's turn to the third finding. So one of the things that um, people wondered was, and, and we got to be careful here, right? Like it's year one uh, and we know what we know and there may be unintended consequences, you know, that are still playing out. And there are some questions and br keep bringing the questions in, questions about, you know, what about those who didn't get funding and, you know, that kind of thing. And that's that's a really important question, and that's not in the scope of this study. We're looking at what happened to these organizations. But Ellie, can you tell us whether leaders so far, early days, are experiencing uh, negative unintended consequences? Yes. Um, so to date, few nonprofits say that they've encountered organizational challenges or faced disruptions, um, such as declines in other funding as a result of these grants. Uh, instead, Leaders were able to address longstanding needs and reported increased confidence uh, and credibility for their organizations. The main lesson that they believe this experience holds for other funders is to have more trust in nonprofits. And organizations didn't experience many challenges you know, with how to use these funds because as Lisa had shared with us before about her own organization, 
many already had plans in place um, that they either wanted to accelerate or needed the funds to support. Uh, for others, budgetary there were budgetary gaps that this money easily filled. And yet for others, um, they used the grant to respond to emergencies, either brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic or racial injustice. To the extent that there have been challenges, leaders told us they stem from the fact that you know, their organizations just had so many unmet needs, um, more than this, this large grant could even address. As we mentioned before, many of the leaders interviewed said that this gift increased their organization's credibility and confidence. So they report that fundraising has not been more difficult after receiving this grant as some had feared. Uh, the respondents were more likely to indicate funding from both foundations and individual donors had increased rather than decreased. And about three quarters of leaders reported that receiving this grant even changed their approach to fundraising. Many of them described a shift uh, to a more strategic approach with their fundraising. And the two most common lessons that leaders shared with us, and I think we've heard those uh, lessons already from Kyra and Lisa today. Um, one is that leaders are learning what it feels like to think bigger in terms of what's possible for their organizations, both programmatically and when it comes to fundraising. Uh, and they also highlight for themselves and for their peers, um, the importance of having a strategic plan in place should their organization receive this type of funding um, in the future. And one final um, and important point that I'd like to share is that nonprofit leaders didn't only communicate lessons that they learned for themselves um, and their peers, they also communicated a hope for funders. So a hope that you know, these experiences, receiving these large unrestricted gifts from Scott would encourage other funders to trust nonprofits more than they have to date. So the trust that you know, came with receiving these large and completely unrestricted grants had enabled these organizations to focus the funds where they really needed to focus them in order to make progress with their own missions. And many nonprofits contrasted the experience of receiving this gift with other funding relationships that they've had in which they find that they're spending so much time responding to funder demands um, and truly making compromises in the way that they do their work. Thanks so much, Ellie. And, and Kyra, I believe you sort of experienced directly this um, dynamic where you received a multi-year large grant that you think you wouldn't have received had you not been a recipient of a gift from Mackenzie Scott. Is that right? Do I have that right? Well, I, I, I'm not sure that we would not have received it, but I think that it definitely helped in the decision making to see the impact and to see that there were plans for it. The strategy was in place and it definitely generated a number of conversations. I will say this, we are very fortunate in that we have uh, long held funders or as we call them partners at Wire Media that really invest deeply in us and talk with us and have conversations with us, not lobbying demands at us. So we are fortunate in that. But what I did have conversations with some of those partners with was, so what about this unrestricted aspect? How has that helped you? Do you see a big difference? Are your conversations different? So it piqued curiosity. They really wanted to know how that worked. And they also shared some things that they were having more conversations within their boards about unrestricted giving and how it could have impact on grantees and what other things could they be doing to improve their relations with grantees and, and let them see that the trust is there. Because I, I think in some cases, they don't even necessarily see restricted giving as a lack of trust, but more like an attempt to kind of frame up work and impact. And so for those conversations, having received that Mackenzie Scott funding, it really, I believe, made it a difference. And it was a conversation that I don't think would have happened in the past. Can I build off of Kyra now? <laughs> Please, I love when you build off of me. I think so Bill's so frozen, so we can say whatever we want. <laughs> we run um, this now. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I just want to build off this because I think there's also something underneath all of this. So yeah, you know, let's work to normalize trusting the nonprofit and um, encourage other funders to have the same kind of trust and um, make similar investments. But I think underneath it, 
there is we've, we've taken over phil uh, Good. but i think under underneath it there's also a shift in how nonprofits are approaching the conversations so for us it allowed us to launch an initiative and we did this very intentionally because this initiative is called 25 and 5 but it's about giving us the path to achieve our mission and almost like creating um test case test cases for us to be able to scale out so how do we better understand what the problem is how do we pull that data and then how do we create a roadmap and build the partnerships for achieving equity within the systems we're partnering with and so for us now we're having a completely different conversation we're moving from okay funder fund this one playground to we're trying to solve a more systemic issue across a public system and um, we're doing some really important work in Uvalde right now as part of this initiative, where we would have historically gone in and built one playground, did all this work around trust building and um, creating access for a subset of that community to have a great place for the kids. We went into it with a different approach now that we've shifted because we got this gift, because we've changed our approach to how we do our work to really look at deep impact. We've gone into that partnership to say, let's look across your city and see how do we fix this problem. So for us, we now know, you know, $3 million, we can fix the problem. Everybody in uh, all kids in Uvalde can have equitable access to great places to play. It has equipped us to now have that conversation with the funder. We would not, we would have probably inched down a path where we would have continued to have conversations where we're creating that win-win and where we're saying, okay, well, you know, let's do this one project rather than saying, no, we need your resources to fix this problem. We've identified this problem. This is what we're committed to moving forward. And so I think there's not just the trust and the kind of normalization that I hope ends up occurring around unrestricted gifts, but I think nonprofits have also changed their behavior around what, how they're asking for gifts and the problems that they're trying to solve and how they're presenting that to funders. Thank you. Um, and, you know, we, it relates a little bit to something else that we have a whole sidebar in the report about, which is just um, the freedom to collaborate uh, in, in different ways. Uh, but I, I, rather than going into that, I want to, I want to get to some of the questions here. Ellie, there was one data question that I think it's actually worth addressing, which is just um, because I think it's sort of a how much can you fit on one slide kind of thing, and it's just important to clarify that going all the way back, um, the, somebody wondered about we had strong majorities saying that that you know th th this grant allowed them to significantly strengthen their ability to you know achieve their mission or you know the other dimensions back in that first finding. It, the question was kind of like what about the other ones, the ones who didn't say that? What did they say? Um, can you can you just address address that? Sure. Um, so the percentages that I shared were uh, nonprofit organizations that had said this grant was significantly strengthening the ability to achieve mission, financial stability, and organizational capacity. The most of the remainder of organizations said it was moderately strengthening those um, their ability to you know to achieve those things. Yeah. Got it. Got it. And and then um, another. Um, question that I think is really important to address that isn't in the scope of this study, but I think it's just something that's been um, surrounding conversations about Mackenzie Scott has to do with with transparency. Um, and so I, I, I wonder, um, the, the person asks, to what extent do you think donors like Mackenzie Scott should be speaking publicly about their style of grant making? Um, and this is from a, another a grant maker. Uh, is it a better strategy to step back and let the nonprofit speak for themselves or to actively espouse their approach to trust-based giving? What is likely to be more influential on the field of philanthropy? Does anybody have a hot take on that? I feel like it's a game show. We've got to get to the buzzer. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fair amount of transparency in the, the posts uh, that Mackenzie Scott has put forth in explaining what the parameters were. I actually did encounter someone who thought that the giving was just willy nilly, you know, like Willy Wonka style, like, hey, you get the golden ticket. And, and that it's helpful to have a framing for that, the intentionality around 
the leaders and, and diversity and equity and inclusion and underrepresented communities, having that framing is important. I believe there was a substantial amount of that information. Being somebody from the media myself, I, I felt pretty well versed on what was happening. You know, there, the people who thought it was a golden ticket, they might have just been you know, mystified. But if I think that there was plenty of information out there that explained exactly why this was going on. Stephanie? Yeah, I mean, to the part about whether or not, I, I agree. I think she's sharing and she's reflecting and she's committed to the database and all those other things. And that's more than many donors um, are able to do or do, right? Um, at the same time, the question also asked about, should she be using her, how other ways might she be using her voice? And, and I think, you know, so much of what she's done is signaling um, to others and then sharing the story of why, um, which is really powerful. And it has influenced philanthropy. There's no doubt that it's, um, we wouldn't be having this conversation if it wasn't having some impact on this field and how people think about giving. Um, and I would say, you know, um, in the individual donor segment, you know, so seven of the dollars given away every year, like the overwhelming majority are directed by unstaffed, you know, individuals. It's not foundations. It's not people like me. It's people who are at home and reading the regular news and maybe not in these conversations all the time. And so, you know, I, our trustees at least very much recognize that their voice can be really powerful um, as, you know, as a foundation that's committed to a world where race is no longer a predictor of, predictor of life's outcomes, especially for young people. They really want to um, you know, take on the responsibility that they have as white people with wealth to influence others and bring others um, into a, a, a vision of a more just and equitable world and future. And so I think there's benefits to both. Do you think, Stephanie, that you have seen or will see changes in the behavior, that's not the right word, sort of the the way of being, the attitude of nonprofits that you're funding in terms of what they ask for? I mean, do you think that mm. leaders will be emboldened? Um, and do, do you see people acting differently uh, after they get one of these gifts or, or too early to tell? Maybe too early to tell, but I do think, I hope that leaders are emboldened. I, I heard stories just now from Lisa and Kyra, like people yeah. are asking different things of their funders and are able have the power to stand up to their funders and say like, listen, that's not, it won't work that way for us. Um, and yeah. that's so important that, um, and you have that power, be, um, you know, when you are not, it, it's a, you know, this dynamic we're always in and the biting your, the hand that feeds you a <laughs> challenge um, in so many different scenarios. But I think this, um, these resources have allowed people who maybe have had more power dynamics in those relationships to even those out and to stand in, in their power. And I think that's really important and, and so valuable. Thank you. So we have, um, Sarah is, is um, monitoring the questions and she, she says there are multiple questions um, and these would be for Lisa and Kyra about um, your internal processes for allocating these funds. Um, in particular, how did you interact with your boards when it came to this gift? We go, Karen. Um, I, I I can start, and you know, it might be something similar. I, I'll start with the board play piece. Um, we have a very strong relationship with our board, and our board has been going through change with us for since before I got here. I've been at Kaboom for seven years, and um, so we've been on a journey together that has been looking at transformation, and um, just kismet, I guess, we had been talking to our board about making a self-investment in ourselves around shifting our work from project to impact driven. And so we had already started to do the work laying out, here's the investments that we need to make in ourselves, here's the um, resources and skills we need around policy and advocacy and government affairs, because we've got to influence where the funding is going and where the decisions are being made at a macro level. The data piece was important to us. So we had already started to carve out that if we're going to look at our mission and work backwards, here's the kind of investments we need to be making year over year so that we can drive toward impact. Um, so our board was very supportive of that. And again, you know, I, I think it 
we were we were ready. We were we were ready with how we would start to invest in ourselves if the resources came. And I think most of it anchored on just a handful of things. One is the data piece that, you know, as a nonprofit, you really have to have the data to better understand the scope and scale of the problem. And that creates your work plan, so to speak. And um, we hadn't had the ability to fully invest in that resource or that talent, um, but we knew we needed it. And so we were ready to invest in that when the minute we got the funding to do it, uh, we were ready to invest in government affairs and we were ready to invest in our M&E work. We had already a robust system for community engagement that's at the center of our work. So we had been thinking about this. We had been talking to our board about it. Um, so we made those investments and then um, and we've carved out our investments over a longer period of time. So that was year one. We didn't want to bite off more than we could chew. Um, we also made investments in our people across the board. The pandemic had and still has put a lot of strain on the people doing the work. You know, we're an organization out here building playgrounds and bringing volunteers and people together in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so putting that, putting the kind of investment in our people to try and figure out how can we lighten the load in a very stressful time and what Kyra was saying around, you know, equitable pay, you know, we still, we, we did an equity audit, we made salary adjustments, I think we still have work to do to be blunt about it, but we'll go into next year with board approval just last week for a second round of investments so that we can start to build off the first. Thank you. Um, Kyra, what was your process like? I would say it's very similar. Our board of directors is extremely supportive, you know, rolling their, their sleeves up to work with us on strategic vision, um, very focused, of course, on the youth that we serve and sustainability. So that's why we were in lockstep on that reserves that we want to build ourselves space to really plan and build out a strategic vision and look at how, you know, we've been around for 30 years. How do we continue to expand that into the future with a really vibrant organization? And we do differ in that we are a media company. We produce music. We produce technology. We produce award-winning journalism. Um, so we really need to have like top-level equipment, facilities, all those things. So the board, you know, is locks up with us on that. And then I would also say expanding our impact. We've been national in scope for some time, but how do we deepen that? And how do we really touch and and you know make sure that in these communities that we're creating enough enough like support for the young people that we're working with and job opportunities, really workforce development too. So we, we were you know standing in shoulder to shoulder with them on that. And I think in general, just having the space to sit and think and come up with plans and come up with things that can only improve the experience is a luxury that a lot of nonprofits do not have. And I think people may not understand that because one of the things that you are required to do, I would say, and please correct me, Lisa, if you disagree, is you always need to be projecting sustainability. You never want to come to any funder in a state of panic because then that puts them into a state of panic. So to be able to be firm, solid, to have that sustainability, to be able to point to reserves, to be able to point to dollar matching or donors getting excited or other funders getting excited, it just puts you in a different position and one that I hope that we can continue, that I hope that people will continue to invest in us and maybe not, you know, windfalls are not um, something that we can reasonably expect every year, but hopefully it just touches it off. We have other billionaires that have been doing, you know, incredible work. Robert F. Smith is, is a good example of someone who's been pouring into HBCUs, pouring into STEAM uh, for young people of color. So I, I'm hoping that this is not like a little a fad or flash in the pan, but something to move forward with. And our board has recognized that it's a windfall, but also is working with us so that we can continue to have structure around our goals and mission and not just to have you know, something that sounds like a catchy tagline, but something that we can actually do over the next decades. Thanks. Um, all right, we are nearing the end of our time. Ellie, there's interest in what years two and three look like uh, uh, briefly. And then I'm gonna ask uh, Lisa, Kyra and Stephanie, just a closing, you know, 20 to 30 second thought, knowing that the audience here, the 1500 registrants overwhelmingly uh, funders, uh, foundation folks, LLCs, individual donors. But Ellie, first, years two and three. Yeah, so in years two and three, we're hoping to examine some of the questions that we know you know take a longer time to be able to answer that we couldn't answer in year one. So, for example, how nonprofits are experiencing, you know, change over time uh, from these gifts 
any additional evidence that they have experienced about the impact of these gifts. And a third, you know, would be um, do the nonprofits that, that Scott funded, are they experiencing a financial cliff, you know, of any sort that would force them to pull back on, you know, the work that they've expanded or the new efforts that they have because they can't continue that funding. So those are just three examples. Great. Thank you. Um, this has been great. Uh, so fun. And I'm so grateful. Um, Ellie, again, to you for all your work. You've spent a lot of time and energy with um, our colleagues working on this and done a great job. But I want to give Lisa, Kyra, and Stephanie the last word. You've been the best panel ever. Uh, 30 seconds each. What's one thought you'd like to leave the audience with? That's a big, that's a big task. I was going to build off of Ellie, someone I would like to see in the future in kind of measuring impact. Um, one I mentioned, the link between innovation and impact and progress against our mission. And then I think we are in a moment where we have to foster cross-sector partnerships. So with peer organizations, with government entities, with philanthropy. And so how are how has this gift allowed us to bring all of these different people to the table to collectively pool our data and to create a roadmap for the work ahead and to bite it off together. So I, I, I know that it has forced us into fostering public-private partnerships. I think we need more philanthropy at the table, quite frankly. Um, but I would like to see, you know, what's happening with how we're working together with our public systems, with our private systems, and with philanthropy overall. Um, because that is where we're going to really start to address some of these critical issues. We cannot, we cannot unpack all of this alone and solve all of this alone. We've got to uh, foster those kind of collaborations. Thank you, Lisa. Kyra? I am going to use this wonderful platform to, again, advocate for women of color in leadership. And I'm, I know that equity is something that I'm sure everyone on this call and everyone who joins is concerned with. And the real way to do that is to help those who are double other. So helping those who are double other helps everyone. And so if we can continue this investment, continue this energy long after the pandemic hopefully is gone, I think that we will see a real transformation in our society. And this gift is but one step in a journey that is long overdue. And I just hope that funders will help us make that the rest of that journey together. Thank you so much. Stephanie. Here, here, here. I'm really so hopeful and wanting to, you know, keeping my fingers crossed for so many things that might show up in the next three years of research and in the long term in our field. And um, you know, the the uh, joy and and power of what you captured in here uh, in the report and on this conversation. Um, I want to really continue to, um, I don't know what the word is, kick uh, philanthropy forward, keep kicking. We got to keep changing how we do the work and, and how we resource the work. And um, it's really exciting. So thanks for this opportunity to just be here. Thank you so much. I'm going to just welcome Sarah back as I do that. Want to again thank also Maria Lopez, Katerina Malmgren, and Christina M, who did all this work with Ellie. I just want to acknowledge them. And Sarah, you have been a huge part of this whole process of getting this report out into the world. So thanks to you. Two, you get the last word. Thank you, Phil. Um, uh, I'd want to just bring our discussion to a close today and say a huge thank you to our fantastic panelists for joining us and to you all for joining us. Um, Quick note, because we are the Center for Effective Philanthropy and we love our surveys, you will be receiving a survey in your inbox uh, if you haven't already asking for feedback on this event so we can continually improve our programs. Um, please take two minutes to fill it out. It really does help us. And thank you all again, um, and we'll see you next time. Thanks all. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.